Hey guys, Volacy here. Hope that you're having a good week. It's about time that we wrapped up the results for the CRIT event that happened recently. And for those of you guys who don't, who don't know, CRIT stands for Custom Rules Infinity Tournament. So this was where I decided to modify the basic fundamental ways of playing Infinity and the rules and uh, invited people to come in and test those rules. So um, again, if you living on a rock and aren't aware of this, we uh, did away with a 15 unit order cap and we raised that to 20 items. So, you know, mines and uh, hollow echoes and things, uh, not hollow echoes, it was mainly mines and equipment and peripherals that would count towards that limit, but you had 20. Uh, we changed the crit mechanics so that it did plus eight damage on the crit uh, rather than an additional save. We changed a bunch of other things, gave everybody a free reroll, and uh, everybody had a good time. We had um, 18 people play in the event, which was a nice little number for me to get some testing done. So, um, the end result was uh, Cavrion coming first with Steel Phalanx, actually running a 10 order list rather than, um, you know, using the unit cap. That's great. Uh, gives us a chance to sort of see how well, you know, a list that's perfectly valid for normal N4 goes in this uh, weird and wacky uh, experimental rules environment. I do have to add the disclaimer there that both Cavrion and Perjan were undefeated at the end. It'd be quite cool to see them play against each other with crit rules with their lists. That'd be fun to watch and, and find out the outcome of. Uh, Perjan, of course, uh, took the opposite approach, which was to take a lot of Daylamis, which is a valid strategy under the current rules because you have um, a much higher cap and you can just take more of them. So unfortunately, that is a bit of a flaw in um, my custom rules design allowing Hakaslam to do that. I was aware of that at the time and uh, understandable, but hey, look, you shift the goalposts at most a little bit, there are always going to be um, issues uh, with balance. My hope was that it would just result in better list building if we did this and maybe give some of the weaker factions a chance, such as Imperial Service, US Ariadna, that kind of thing. Um, we did talk to Bad Lazar, who played Imperial Service and, of course, was able to take a much uh, bigger list as a result. Um, that didn't really make Imperial Service, you know, super humongously powerful. I did play against him with my Nomads. I was the buy-round player. Um, but again, not enough data to have a look at it. I think that it did help them, but again, it doesn't somehow make Imperial Service suddenly the best faction uh, because everybody else does have that higher unit cap as well. We did have our USARF player also participate, but unfortunately um, he mentioned to me that his peripherals were counting towards the cap quite a lot, and he still couldn't, you know, go and just blast out and blow out to 20 orders. Um, just in general, I think everybody had a good time. We'll have a look at the poll results, but one of the, one of the big takeaways here is that um, none of the changes were really game-breaking. They weren't completely devastating to the meta. And they didn't result in some factions being just drastically more powerful than others. So, realistically, um, the changes, um, and, and I kind of predicted this really, weren't really that drastic and didn't really affect the gameplay very much. On paper, when you read the crit rules, they can seem like just a massive departure from normal world Infinity and 4. But they really aren't, and I think experienced players can appreciate that as can the people that were in this event as well. Cool. Um, yeah, my own games, I mean, I was playing Nomads. I just wanted to see if, the, if it felt like the disparity between Nomads being ultra-powerful and other factions not as being as, as powerful was uh, maybe a little bit diminished, like that, that, that gap between their power level and other factions was a bit smaller as a result. You know, I, I felt that a little bit. Um, in my lists, I had to sort of choose between taking um, the uh, Uberfall Commandos versus, um, you know, a lot of Morans, that, that sort of thing. I always took the Puppet Bots. Um, I usually took the Morans. Sometimes I just ran the Zeros instead. Um, but generally, um, you know, Nomad's obviously still very powerful. They just got, you know, slightly toned back, and other factions had more opportunity than they normally would. <coughs> Excuse me. So there was that. Um, I won all of my games, but again, I was the buy round player, um, and yeah, I didn't get to play the top table. So I played against Dylan, I played against Bad Lazor, and played against Pseudonymster for the first time, I might add. Um, you can see my games up um, 
I think I posted my game against Bad Lazor, and uh, Pseudonymsta posted my game against him on uh, the Dice Abide YouTube channel. Didn't get a chance to play against Almost Happy, that game didn't quite get scheduled, and I should note that there were a couple of games that uh, didn't really quite finish at the end there, but they may still be uh, be posted up. Alrighty. Um, oh, uh, one thing I forgot to really talk about was the fact that um, Cavrion won with, uh, well, he won four of his games with Steel Phalanx taking um, a single combat group list, and he went first every game, and his strategy was just take take the big boys, right? He's got Achilles and Hector in there, and um, just characters that can bowl across the other side of the table and kill everybody. And um, one comment that came up was that maybe we shouldn't have the, the, um, the protection for limited insertion lists, where in my tournaments, you're not allowed to spend a command token to strip their their order pool by two if they only have a single combat group. What I want to say in response to that is that um, people didn't seem to play the right way against Cavrion from what I'm hearing, and secondly, um, nobody decided to take first turn against him, and by his own admission, um, it may have been possible for, you know, a 20 order list to just steamroll him. So don't, you know, take away from that that somehow 10 order steel phalanxes more powerful than it should be. I think that it's fine. And when I say 10 orders, I mean 10 units. He obviously had more like 13, 14 orders because of all the other stuff going on there with Stratagos. Um, so there is that. Um, one thing that was suggested was to make it so that if you're running a single combat group, you get counterintelligence instead. I kind of like that. I, I might actually implement that in future, but I probably would put the caveat in there that um, if you are using any of the following rules, so that is Stratagos, NCO, Tactical Awareness, any of those three rules, then it counts as counterintelligence. But if you've got a single combat group list without using those rules, then you should be protected against um, the combat, the, so the command token stripping two orders away from you. If you're running like a tag, Joan of Arc, that kind of thing, honestly, um, you know, having the extra orders there is, is kind of needed. It's it's a weak sort of list in general. And I, I'm still not worried about the whole pain train, tactical awareness, order, invincible army, Morat kind of thing, where you're just steamrolling up the board with the pain train link team. Because look, there are there are ways to deal with it. You've got hidden deployment, you've got hacking, you've got um, the ability to just hide a lot of market state troops. It's not actually as bad as you might think uh, it is by looking at it on paper. So I wanted to point that out. Um, Cavrion's a good player, he's done well, but by no means do we need to think differently about Steel Phalanx in my view. You guys just need to sort of come along with a better game plan. That's how I feel about it. Alrighty, uh, let's go to the Zexit poll then. So we had um, a bunch of you guys um, actually giving me some feedback. I was only looking for feedback from people who actually entered the event. So thank you very much, guys, for voting. So this first question um, was basically just giving um, some thoughts here. And I asked people to just put a check mark next to the things they agreed with. So what really interested me is that it was fairly even between... Um, people who thought that the current 15 unit camp in ITS is good and fine, doesn't need improvement, and people who don't think it's fine and we should look for a fix for it, that it seems to be pretty even amongst people who played in my event. The uh, 20 item cap that I introduced, again, people are pretty evenly split about whether they prefer that over a 15 unit cap or not, it's just even even numbers. Um, in my opinion, after playing my own event and thinking about it, I don't really like the 20 unit cap anymore. I don't quite think that that is fair. It's not very intuitive. Um, it's it's a reasonable rule and it makes list building a little bit more interesting. So I personally prefer it, obviously, to the 15 unit cap. But um, I'm not going to be introducing the item cap thing in future events. So don't worry about that one, guys. Quite a few of you guys said that you're interested in trying out other ideas that increase the unit cap. 15 unit caps just seems like it makes the game a little bit bland, a little bit stale, a little bit too solved too quickly. And uh, it would be nice to give people out there some more list building possibilities. These days with N4, I look at some factions and there's only a few variations of one possible list and everything else beyond that just isn't very viable. And I don't particularly like that. Quite a few of you guys don't either. 
Um, there was there was some talk at one point about restricting orders spent rather than models on the table, and you guys didn't particularly like that. I don't particularly like it either. Um, if you said something like, okay, you can spend up to 20 orders um, in your turn, and that includes Impetuous and Tactical Awareness and NCO and all of that stuff, Lieutenants, um, but you can have as many models on the table as you want, um, you, you've got a bit of a different problem there because some factions are really good at putting out spammy arrow pieces like their armies. So that sort of angle, that approach doesn't really sit very well. Interestingly, the most popular um, thing here was actually my latest idea, which was coming up with a custom system that nominates certain unpopular character models, which nobody runs in their lists, and saying, right, these characters have a special passive rule um, known as requisition, where when they come along in the mission and the part of your little army group, they can bring along more support with them, meaning that the unit cap is, is actually lifted a bit and extended as a result of your inclusion of that character. Here's my idea about how that would look. So here's a spreadsheet. I'll put a link to this in the um, in the video description if you guys want to have a look through. Here are some character profiles from the di different factions, except for I think Toha's not there. And um, I've just specified which sectorials particularly can use the profile. And in this column, column I've got a 1 or a 2, meaning that a 1 says that if you have this character in your army list, you can go up to 16 units rather than 15. If you have the character with a 2 next to it, you can go up to 17. So looking at it, if you play Vanilla Pano or Military Orders and you have Deferson, who I don't see a lot of competitive players running Deferson in tournament lists, and even if you did, um, it still wouldn't make Pano overly powerful if they could have 16 units in their list and, uh, compared to your 15, provided that they're including def included Deferson, who's not the most points efficient and who's quite expensive anyway. But, you know, that just gives you a little bit more incentive to run Deferson and gives you the opportunity to write some lists that have a little bit more... Um, of, you know, supporting one expensive model, Deferson, and a lot of less expensive models and having some more orders to play with. We come to a guy down here like Sargosh, who is a really, really weak character for Vanilla Combined Army and Shazvasti. He's only got one wound. He's got a lot of special abilities. He's very expensive, but he's just so fragile and vulnerable to the slightest uh, pinprick of damage. So we're saying here that, you know, another way you could play Sargosh rather than just trying to hope that he doesn't die is including him in your list for the sake of getting up to 17 orders and including more smaller nasty things. So you could play, for example, Shaz Vasti and you have one order group with like seven tiger creatures, but your first order group happens to have Sargosh. So it's weakened in one respect and buffed in another respect. And that just gives you another way to play that faction, which I think is quite cool. So um, let me know what you guys think. This is a pretty um, underdeveloped idea. Um, apparently, you know, quite a lot of you guys like the idea of exploring it. I don't know how soon I'll bring it into an actual event, but it's definitely something to have a discussion about. All right. So moving on, we talked about critical hits. Um, in my crit event, basically, if you roll a crit, you get plus 8 to the damage. So a combi rifle's damage uh, 21, meaning that if you have tons of armor, you still might save it. So it's a little less punishing than N3, but it doesn't have the potential for additional wounds like N4 does, where if you take two armor saves and just flunk them both, you take two wounds, whereas... In N3, the most you could ever take was one. And we talked about why that's an important difference. It means the variance is a bit wider in N4. And sometimes, you know, lucky dice rolls can swing it too far in one or the other direction. Whereas N3 was a little bit too decisive and didn't really account for a target's armor. Whereas my version um, helps to deal with those problems. A lot of you guys still prefer N4, and I think that's a comfort thing. Um, a quarter of you did uh, like my crits, which is good to hear. But um, I think one piece of feedback I'm going to take on board with this is that it kind of slows the game down a little bit because you have to split up the dice rolls and some people weren't really comfortable with that. Armor piercing rounded down, not up. So if you've got a multi-rifle and you're shooting at a light infantry model with one armor, now armor piercing actually works against his tiny flak jacket as, it's, as it should. And I think a lot of people like that intuitive uh, thing, which is why 75% of you guys um, gave this the thumbs up. 
And um, a few people, although they criticised the idea that, you know, models with specifically Armour 3 or Armour 5 really suffered as a result, I think we can agree that that's a negligible kind of consideration compared with the benefits of actually making this change. Um, deployment equipment, deployment equipment is S0, so mines actually um, do have a camo state which is equivalent to their real state, their real silhouette value. The only criticism I got around this was that it was worded in such a way that it applies to like crazy koalas and stuff. That's just an easy fix that I can make. In general, you guys did actually like this change though. One reroll per game, um, most of you guys didn't like it, um, and I think that's just because people forgot to use it so often. Um, so it just, it seemed like an annoying thing to remember rather than something which helped to mitigate luck, and I can appreciate that. Limited insertion protection, we talked about this, um, Cavrion's list had a lot of Stratagos in it and um, some big boys with Inamitakos that could bowl up the field and just kill you, but again, um, the majority of you guys are fine with that. I think the problem is in not preparing well enough against that kind of list, not taking the opportunity to go first, not hiding things well enough, not counterattacking them well enough. The rules that we're playing with here aren't the issue. And lastly, um, people seem to have really enjoyed Crit League, uh, despite um, the negative attention on Reddit. People had a great time and, of course, weren't causing any dramas or problems to people not involved in the league. And, of course, this isn't being somehow taken up by Corvus Belli or other tournament uh, runners. It's not being forced on anybody, which is really, um, you know, the main takeaway from this. People can have a good time. People can try some different rules, and it doesn't need to break anything. It doesn't need to attack or cause any problems with the community. So, overall, guys, thank you very much for being in my little event. Um, what I'm thinking of doing is... Um, coming up with some um, custom rules for the campaign which will be next maybe later in the year we're not really going to mess with the rule system with all the crit stuff here it's more going to be about like how the campaign will be run uh, the games themselves are likely to be pretty standard infinity in four corvus belly is going to be bringing out a new season soon and i hear that they might be changing the fire team rules uh, in particularly making uh, mixed fire teams work a bit differently we're all excited to see how that will work so i might wait for that uh, to come out before we actually do the campaign but the last two campaigns have been a blast so i hope you guys um, are excited as well and uh, look out for my announcements around those thanks again guys see you later